Hi everybody, Zeev Simon here. I'm the creator of Surgical Master, the surgical training for dentists. Welcome to another instant replay, which is a type of presentation I record shortly after a surgical procedure, where I give you a recap and give you some tips and tricks and the lessons that I've learned. And uh, I love recording presentations based on your questions. So uh, thank you for, first of all, the support and also for um, you know, sending me those questions because they give me an endless resource uh, to record videos and create some training programs for you. So thanks again. In this instant replay, I'm going to talk about how to manage a relatively large buccal defect after extracting a lower incisor, which is a challenge, and I wanted to share this case with you. So this patient came in with pain on a lower incisor, tooth number 25, a central incisor, and was very sensitive on percussion. And looking at the radiograph, I noticed a large periapical lesion, not just on the central incisor, but also extending to the lateral incisor, number 26. And these are the two teeth that were um, you know, basically causing pain. So I looked at the vestibule and I noticed some swelling and when I palpated, that also caused some pain and it felt very uh, rubbery and, and depressible. So I was already suspecting that there is an infection extending from the tooth that uh, dissolved some of the buccal plate and I was suspecting a relatively large abscess. So I did look at the CT scan and the CT scan basically showed that the central incisor has uh, quite extensive bone loss on the buccal aspect, uh, at the apical area, and also on the lingual aspect. But I also notice uh, part of the bone that is close to the coronal part of the root. So that could represent a bridge of bone that is uh, there. So when you look at the scan, try to predict where the bone is missing and where the bone is still existent, so it'll help you with the procedure. So the, the infection extended quite uh, significantly into the apical direction. And looking at the lateral incisor number 26, there was a large apical lesion as well, also with buccal bone loss. So I felt that tooth number uh, 25 was likely fractured, and there's uh, the large infection and how it's uh, extending around the root. And I also checked uh, number 23 uh, that at the moment looked relatively healthy, maybe thin buccal plate right here, but looked relatively healthy. So, you know, what are the options for a situation like that? Definitely extracting tooth number 25. Uh, very likely it's fractured. There's a large infection, so the prognosis is hopeless. And unfortunately, there was also some collateral damage to number 26, so I did recommend extracting both. Now, here we have some options. Uh, the more definitive, the more predictable option is to recommend a strategic extraction of tooth number 23 and eventually replace with two implants, uh, either immediately or delayed, and restore with a three-unit bridge, implant bridge. For this patient, because only number 25 and 26 were damaged, and number 23 seemed to be intact, uh, the patient did not, did not want me to extract it. So uh, the um, permission I got was to extract 25 and 26 and assess number 23 at the same time of the procedure. But if everything is okay, the plan is to place one implant uh, in a delayed fashion and restore with two units, basically with a cantilever restoration that can work uh, quite well in this part of the mouth. So the treatment plan for this patient is to extract number 25 and number 26. We will assess number 23 at the time of surgery and maybe make some further recommendations. But we already plan to have um, bone augmentation or, or bone grafting at the same time and place a provisional restoration that is removable, what we call a flipper. And after a healing period, place one implant either at the number 25 or 26 position, whichever bone is better, which whichever site is better for an implant, and eventually restore with a cantilever. So th this is our treatment plan. So how are we going to do this? What is the sequence? What is the flap design? And uh, let, me, let me show you how, how all of this worked. Now, during the same day, I had uh, four visitors from Japan that spent the day with me. It was great. We met 
really early in the morning, 6.30 in the morning. We're already reviewing some uh, procedures and flap designs and some implant procedures, including uh, the case that I'm going to share with you. And it was just great to have my, my Japanese friends uh, observing and uh, literally participating in the procedure. And um, it was just a lot of fun. So this procedure was done under IV sedation. The uh, patient was sleeping throughout the procedure. And if you look at the, um, at the um, preoperative situation, um, when you are suspecting a large infection, it's very important to have good visibility and good access to the infection later on for the bone grafting. So what I recommend in this type of situation is to create an intracellular incision, and I extended it from the, uh, between the canines pretty much, but also added a vertical releasing incision. That allows with access, and you, you may notice that the tissue for this patient is relatively thick and dense, and with a vertical release, sometimes it's easier to bypass all sorts of bone irregularities and undercuts. Now, some of you may wonder, why did I create this uh, horizontal uh, extension? Why did I just make uh, a basically uh, a, 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 a vertical release from the uh, distal line angle of the canine? Well, what I wanted to do is create some tissue bulk right in here uh, on the distal of the canine, so it'll be easier for me to suture. So I'd like you to focus on your flap design so it'll make your life easier and less, uh, complica less complicated uh, at all phases of treatment. So the first thing that I did, uh, I marked the teeth to be extracted. You know, lo low incisors, they all look the same. Uh, it's just as easy to extract the wrong tooth. So I have a habit of marking the teeth that I plan to extract. I compare it to the provisional. I look at the chart again, look at the radiograph, look at the consent forms, look at my report to the dentist, and make sure that I have the right teeth, uh, because again, the patient is sleeping, there's nobody to, to talk to, so I just um, have this um, system in place to make sure that the right treatment is given to the right patient. So I mark the teeth with an X, make sure that we extract the right ones, and I started by reflecting a full thickness flap, also extending the uh, vertical releasing incision, and when I reflect a, a, you know, a relatively large flap, we can start seeing the infection on the buccal as aspect of mostly tooth number 25, but also extending to number 24, which we saw in the scan. We can also start looking at the ridge of bone or the bridge of bone that is here that will work very hard to preserve. Now looking closer at the infection, what you may need to do is separate it from the flap somewhere around here because the infection and the flap, um, they're basically one. And, um, you know, sometimes the flap can get uh, perforated if you're not careful. So take some, take some caution, take some time to separate the flap from the infection. The next thing that I did, I used forceps to extract the teeth. I try not to create any lateral movements to preserve the bone, the interceptal bone or the bridge of bone. And with rotational movement, it's, it was relatively easy to extract both teeth, 25 and 26. So we're looking at the extraction area right after uh, the teeth were removed. And you can tell that I was able to preserve the ridge. There may be a little uh, green stick fracture right in here. That could be. And I was able to preserve the interceptal bone. Now the next step is to debride the, uh, the defect. And the challenge here is that we have... Uh, not really a window. It's an interesting shape of um, access through the buckle. And based on the scan, and also what I saw clinically, is that the infection undermined itself in bone, in an undercut. So the access is relatively difficult with conventional instruments, with um, even the smallest curettes that I have. So try to access the infection from uh, a, vertical, uh, a vertical angle but also through the defect. Now, I was having a little bit of a hard time accessing the undercut, and in the process, I did lose the interceptal bone. Basically, became loose, and I, and I had to remove it, so that's not a good thing. Uh, but on the flip side, now I had great access into the defect, in, into all the undercuts in bone, and I spent good five to ten minutes cleaning out the def defect, removing all the infection, all the granulation tissue, until I reached healthy bone, bleeding bone, 
and that allowed me to proceed to the next step. Now, what's important again, to maintain the bridge of bone, even if you have a little fracture, as long as it's all stable, that really helps you in maintenance of a membrane later on. So the next thing that I do, I create some, um, you know, some membranes, and we see that the lingual plate is, is missing as well, partially missing, not as bad as the buccal. So I'll create a membrane for the lingual, and uh, also a, a membrane for the, uh, the buccal. So we'll uh, place the lingual membrane first, trim a membrane for the buccal that will cover the whole defect, and then start with adding bone graft material into the defect. Now this could be a little bit tricky because as you condense bone vertically, the bone graft material will want to go out through the, uh, through the window. So you have to use only you know, light to moderate force and basically alternate between vertical condensation and lateral condensation with the other end of the instrument. So that, that has to be done very, very carefully to make sure that you have the defect well packed and with bone graft uh, in place. Now when you're done, I would add a little bit more bone graft material, basically excess bone, and then add the membrane on the buccal aspect. And typically as you place it, uh, and gets hydrated by blood, you can adapt it pretty well. Now, the key is to suture the flap without having the membrane move too much. So that, that you'll have to juggle a little bit. You'll have to hold the collagen membrane with uh, cotton pliers and then cover the flap on top. Now, the occlusal part of the extraction socket is covered by two layers. One layer is um, a collagen plug and underneath we see a PRF plug which is a biologic membrane uh, it's made out of the patient's own blood and that can enhance the healing process so you're noticing that I'm grafting this site in compartments buccal lingual and occlusal all separately uh, this is a type of technique I've been using for a long time probably over 15 years and it's not very well taught or utilized uh, I find it very easy I find it useful it's very hard to uh, you know, take one membrane to drape from the buccal over the occlusal and into the lingual. It's hard to get stability. And I find that if I work in compartments, it really makes my life much easier. And I, and I, get, <laughs> I get pretty good results. So I don't see a problem with that. And I, I wanted to share this technique with you. So the next step after this, uh, uh, the placement of the membranes and the different compartments, uh, we will do the suturing. Now, it's important to have a flap that is well adapted and very, very stable. Now remember, we made a vertical releasing incision, and that would be the first point of entry to place your first suture. I'm using Gore-Tex 5.0 sutures, and I'll place a simple interrupted suture to uh, basically on the distal aspect of the canine. And then I'll place uh, one or two X sutures on top of the ex extraction sockets. Then I'll go back to the vertical releasing incision and place one or two gut 5-0 sutures because what you don't want to do is suture the occlusal surface and then all of a sudden you'll create some tension, you'll have a hard time closing the vertical. So I typically go back and forth. So starting with the vertical, one suture, then go going over the occlusal surface of the extraction socket, going back to the vertical, one or two gut sutures, and then going back to the extraction socket and also the uh, distal to the uh, lateral to create stability and then if there, if there is a need you'll add a few more gut sutures in the vertical until everything is tight and, and stable. Then you can adjust your provisional, the your immediate provisional and place it, place it. So basically this concludes how I handled this uh, situation. I wanted to give you a couple of um, pointers. Uh, first of all the importance of saving the bridge. Save the bridge because this will facilitate the membrane position. If you lose it you can pretty much expect uh, much more bone loss and less uh, successful graft procedure. And I'll, I'll definitely share this case with you when everything heals and when the time comes to place implants. So do whatever you can to save any bone. And I, I did not, uh, I was not able to save the interceptal bone uh, and um, that allowed me to uh, debride much better. So there's a pro and a con. And um, I showed you the multiple barrier technique. Uh, I keep everything separate, lingual, buccal, and occlusal. I find this works uh, very well. It's relatively simple and um, just works, works very well uh, in my hands. So also wanted to thank my uh, friends from 
Japan that uh, spent the day with me and gave me some advice and asked me lots and lots of questions about this case. So I hope you have a safe trip back to Japan and congratulations on your uh, graduation from the um, USC Japan program. Uh, it was great spending time with you. Um, I hope uh, this presentation was very useful to you and valuable and uh, that you can uh, possibly use the same techniques when you have a similar situation in, in your office. Uh, if you feel that uh, this is interesting, uh, you can definitely forward this to a friend or a colleague that uh, can benefit from this as well. And uh, by all means, visit me at surgicalmaster.com. Um, sign up for my handout and uh, some uh, weekly newsletters and blogs and videos. And uh, keep working at it, trying, practicing, and stay in the game. And I look forward to making more presentations for you based on your questions. And I look forward even more to meeting and working with you in the future.